ceilings have the tendency to be rather boring, with lamps being the sole feature to break the white monotony. Let's change that. How to jungle up your ceiling. To create such a green ceiling, we obviously need a plant first. Epipremnum aureum is truly the basic bitch houseplant. Originating from the French Polynesia region, it is now found in many tropical regions and as a common houseplant around the globe. In Germany, it is commonly referred to as Efeutute. In the Anglosphere, it is listed under a ton of names, with Devil's Ivy being my personal favorite. In Russian-speaking regions, it goes by its former scientific name Zlatisti Patos, whilst in Japan it is simply referred to as Potosu. Devil's Ivy belongs to the Arakea family of plants, a family in part characterized by its ability to spawn flowers. Though, thanks to a DNA defect, it is the sole member of its family that doesn't actually goddamn flower, making it a basic bitch houseplant, or shy flowering in scientific lingo. The only thing you should care about, though, is that thanks in part to the plant's excellent energy management, it is, essentially, immortal. It thrives both in direct sunlight as well as dark corners, and has a straightforward water need. You actually have to try to kill it. So how do we even mount plants to the ceiling? Decorative vines meant for exteriors, like the Boston Ivy, mount themselves via sticky fade. For the interior, this is a big no-no, as that would leave marks upon removal. So we will use a plant with vines without the ability to stick or climb. Wikipedia describes Devil's Ivy as having the ability to climb via roots which adhere to surfaces. This is rather imprecise wording. Devil's Ivy attempts to spawn a root roughly once a centimeter in between spawning leaves. If the root touches a moist surface, it will attempt to bore itself into it. Yes, indeed, you heard right. Moist. If it's dry, it's a no-go. So if you buy the plant with a coconut fiber stem to glide onto it, it won't work unless you water the stem itself as well. There is a reason it's made out of absorbent material like coconut fiber. So guess what a photographer does on the move to make an advertisement shot? He uses metal clips or similar for the plant to hold onto the stem. Jesus Christ, way to miss the point of the whole goddamn plant. But I digress. If the spawning roots do not feel any moisture, they instantly stop growing. So Devil's Ivy will never attempt to cling to a wall or ceiling. Not that the roots could even do such a thing on a hard surface. Instead, we will put the vines on a grid or pattern created by fishing line. Fishing line is essentially invisible against the white ceiling and gives the appearance of floating vines. Bore and peg holes in uniform distance from one another around the room. Screw in hooks to the pegs and stick to hooks, not eye screws, because hooks allow you to place part of the vine in it. Using the hooks and fishing line, create a grid or a pattern to lay the vines on top of. I went with a diamond pattern using a total of 12 hooks. It really doesn't matter what pattern you choose, as long as the empty space between the fishing line does not exceed one and a half meters, so a vine will actually reach from line to line in a reasonable time and so that it won't sag from its own weight. You have to tighten the fishing line by a lot to prevent sagging. Even if you do it with a lot of force, there will always be sag no matter what. So make sure to mount the hooks as high as possible to prevent the plants from falling below the level of your ceiling mounted lamp, which would cause your room to get a lot darker. Speaking of which, make sure your fishing line pattern actually leaves the lamp area empty. By the way, it doesn't have to be fishing line. Go with a rope made of coconut fiber or similar for a more pronounced effect. If the plant is happy, it takes six to eight months for one vine to grow from ceiling to the floor. Depending on the pot size and how much water and nutrients it gets, there will be at least a couple vines growing at that speed per pot, with new vines being spawned here and there. Once the vines start interfering with your daily life and reach the floor, it's time for the bi-yearly cleanup. 
Though I must admit, it is kind of funny having to swat away vines from the monitor every week. At this point, the biggest vines are taken back to the ceiling, where they are spread evenly throughout the grid. After this, your ceiling greenery just got a great deal denser. The leaves are attached rather delicately, so be careful not to snag leaves on the fishing line and tear them off. No matter how careful you are though, this will always happen. But do not throw fallen leaves away. Put them into a shot glass and change the water once a week. Oh, damn it, of course I broke two more after filming this. Off into the shot glass you go. A leaf has roughly a 50-50 chance to spawn a root within two weeks. Once the root is roughly a centimeter in size, transfer the leaf into a pot. Once in the pot, it has again a 50-50 chance to spawn a new vine within two weeks. Once this happened, the plant will continue to grow into a fully matured vine network. This one took six months to get from broken baby leaflet to small-sized vine. Once it's at that size, it is ready to join my... Uh... Jungle harem. Just look at those greedy roots. Devil's Ivy has an incredible appetite, so when choosing a pot, always go bigger than what you think you'll need. So how do you even care for the plant? When buying soil from a garden supply store, it usually comes pre-fertilized. On that front, you should be in the clear for at least two years. Otherwise, look up any guide on DIY potting soil. More important is how you deal with water. Smaller pots need to be watered more frequently, whilst a bigger pot gets away with getting a larger amount of water at longer intervals. All that biomass is thirsty indeed. I dump three quarters of a liter per pot once a week. Though to be honest, you can't actually overwater Devil's Ivy. You heard me right. The more the merrier. Dump a whole water bomber into it, if you feel like it. As long as you have proper drainage and the soil has the chance to dry at least once a week. The pots have to drain properly and I cannot overstate this. As long as excess water properly drains out of the pot, you cannot overwater Devil's Ivy. If the water does not properly drain, however, best case scenario, you'll get invisible rot setting in with a significantly weaker plant. What's more likely though, is that your pot will turn into a massive insect grave. And if you are really lucky and really hit the jackpot, straight up mold. At which point, you best just dump the whole thing altogether. To ensure proper drainage, drill way more holes into the pots than you think you'll need. Especially bigger pots often only have a single big hole in the middle. This is not enough. Go ham and drill more than you think you'll need. Next off, fill the bottom fifth of the pot with coarse rocks or large gravel. This will ensure that compacted soil does not clog the holes, which the water is supposed to drain out of. And lastly, actually test it. Sometimes it is not obvious and water decides to just stay in the pot anyways, sometimes due to a flat tray, which creates a seal against the pot. Here I dumped more water than usual into the pot and it instantly starts filling up the tray. This is how it's supposed to work. On the note of trays, they never look particularly great, but in this case they are a must. Of course, ceramic outer pots look great, but once you have enough biomass or a bigger pot, you will not be able to separate the outer pot from the inner pot. And water staying in the outer pot is not any better than a straight up clog. Also, make sure that the tray can actually hold some damn water. I know it doesn't look very appealing having trays way bigger than the actual pot, but trays like these are just useless. Oh, they look great, size matched and all, but cannot hold any reasonable amount of water. Also, if you cannot move the pot, which if the pot is big enough, you won't be able to, believe me, you have to remove excess water with fabric. So make sure that you can actually get cloth into the tray in the first place. So again, as long as the pot drains and the soil dries at least once a week, you're golden. Go ham with water, the more the merrier. While Devil's Ivy can overcome longer periods of drought, as with many tropical plants, ideally the soil should always be moist. But since we are confined to a pot in the interior, it has to dry at least once a week.
So now everything's going great and your vines are growing. But oh dear! Suddenly the plant has yellow leaves that go dry and fall out. Don't worry, this is expected behavior and part of the plant's energy management. A mature vine network will start rejecting undesirable leaves in favor of supplying new and younger vines, even when the network has more than ample supply for itself. Look at this singular vine. Here the leaves are healthy, whilst in the darker corner only half a meter to the left all leaves have dropped, as the network considered them to be undesirable. And yet again, half a meter along the vine, a new, younger branch is growing. This is normal and a way for the vine to reclaim energy spent. Once a leaf has started to turn yellow, there is nothing you can do, as it is chemically marked for death. But don't remove yellow leaves. The leaves don't actually straight up die. Just like with hardwoods in autumn, the leaf turns chloroplasts in its cells into chromoplasts to convert and siphon energy upstream. As long as the leaf remains yellow, it is still a benefit to the plant as a whole. Only once it is dried up should you remove it. This behavior is not limited to leaves, by the way. At some point, even whole branches get rejected, though this happens rarely. Once branches are dried up, you can actually use them to support the grid with new paths, just like fishing line. If a singular vine has lost all of its leaves, but not dried up yet, do not remove them either. Naked branches are still used to transport water and nutrients, just like with a hedge. The inner part of a hedge has no leaves, but it's still part of the living plant. In a healthy plant, the ratio of dying biomass should always be only a fraction of what the network is growing. As long as a lot more biomass is produced than is being reclaimed, you're golden. This aggressive energy management is also why Devil's Ivy can go long stretches without water. During drought, the plant will start to reclaim more and more of its own biomass to keep pumping out new and younger branches in search for water. Two months without water will claim a big chunk of the biomass, but resuming normal water supply should have you reach the same levels of biomass within half a year. This is in part why it's really hard to actually kill Devil's Ivy. It's okay with little water as well as lots of it. Though, if leaves do not turn yellow before dying, something is definitely up. Like here, the green leaves turn straight up black, which means rot has set in. In this case, though, this is traced back to simple physical damage of the vine. If you are patient enough, you can grow out the vines from the floor to the ceiling, but ideally, you should place them high already. I used a bit of wood to create these corner shelves, which were secured with overkill-sized pegs and screws for safety. Since I actually sleep under a pot and don't want to end up like a watermelon in those safety demonstrations. All is said and done, how long will this take you to get all that biomass? With a pot in each corner of the room and under healthy conditions, the plant should produce enough biomass to sparsely cover the ceiling within two years. The plant in my room was actually gifted to our family as a singular vine some 15 years ago, though my room doesn't actually even closely represent 15 years worth of biomass. The vine network has been split multiple times across multiple pots over the years, then neglected for half a decade and then survived being relocated three separate times whilst losing branches each time it was moved. In that sense, you don't even need to buy the plant, as getting a couple of leaves from a donor plant already puts you on the path to jungle them. The original vine network still resides within the spot. The oldest vine, thought to be the original gifted one, is nicknamed Mother Vine and is traced out in red here. It's easily over 20 meters by now. The last time I moved, everything had to be carried by four people, so the vines wouldn't take too much damage. As a last remark, it is often stated that when exposed to direct sunlight, the leaves get more of that white marble pattern. This is only true to some extent. These leaves in direct sunlight are definitely brighter than the deep green coloring of the leaves in the dark corners. This is also evident with the new addition I just planted. This smaller vine was in direct sunlight since it was a broken baby leaflet. However, the degree of marble coloring mostly depends on the color variation of the plant. For instance, this other devil's ivy straight up has the marble pattern everywhere, even in the darkest corner of the room. 
So if you're buying Devil's Ivy, what you see is basically what you get, even if literature claims otherwise. <sighs> And that's more than you would possibly ever need to know about my favorite basic bitch houseplant. Devil's Ivy. Make Papa proud, will you? <laughs>